a border name for little and literary magazines. With her, we have Sunita Karisha Kosha, Lola McDougall, Menka Shindasani, in conversation with the GSP Rao. So, very briefly to give you some background on them. Lola McDougall is the Master's in International Cooperation from Madrid Universidad Complutense, and another in Cultural Management from Barcelona's UOC. She has worked as cultural manager for the Spanish aid agency in Brazil, the Embassy of Spain in India. With Frank Calero, she co-founded Punctum magazine. Punctum. 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 Yeah. A publication devoted to promoting contemporary Asian photography. And she's one of the founders of GoaPhoto.in, a national photography festival which will be held in Belgium, in Goa. Uh, very soon. And uh, Mr. Rao is a founding managing editor of Muse India, a uh, very impressive e journal that showcases Indian writing in English and uh, Indian languages literature in translation. Uh, he's also one of the directors of Hyderabad Literary Festival, which was started as an initiative of Muse India. He's the author of Meghamitra and other poems. It's a collection of poems, The Lock at the Gate, short stories, and Krishna Deva Raya, a historical biography. Sunita is uh, she's Sydney based, but she is presently living at uh, in Goa at Kurtori. She writes uh, fiction plays, her uh, novella is in progress. She also does fiction editing and. She runs Mascara.com, a multicultural literary magazine. Venka Shiv Dasani is author of two collections of poetry. The third one, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> third one, sorry. The three collections of poetry. Uh, she is also the co translator of Freedom and Fishers, an anthology of Sindhi partition poetry published by Sahitya Kathri. She has edited an online anthology of contemporary Indian writing for bigfridge.org, a literary e-zine in the United States. She is also the editor of Sparrow's If the Blue Clicks Let It Be, a volume of writing by Indian women not in Singapore. Her work has been featured in various anthologies. Uh, today they will speak full forth on their experiences in publishing little magazines of high literary quality, both on the, in the print media as well as online. We'll have around 15 minutes of discussion and then let's have an interactive session so that we can all share our aspirations to publish. In a democratic world today, uh, we all have dreams of what you are doing, of doing what you are doing. share my, my experience of <coughs> Muse India. We started Muse India 10 years ago. When we started, we were wondering whether it should be a printed publication or whether it should be a web journal. If we had gone to a printed, printed uh, journal, it would have cost a lot of money. 
Generally, the print publications are expensive. And since we were beginning and we had a group of writers who were very keen to have this journal, we thought the best way would be to start it off as a web journal. And as we go along, we can see whether it also has a print portion of, of the journal. That's how we started News India in 2005. But it has grown so well even as a web journal that we have not come out with a print version today. We have not found it necessary. In the last 10 years, we have reached a readership, we have registered membership of more than 6,000 from 45 countries. News India is exclusively devoted to Indian literature. Not only writing in Indian English, <coughs> but all the regional languages of the country, but in a translated form. It's a final thing. They bring focus on one particular regional language with every issue. Incidentally, we have also covered Tongani language some time ago. Maybe, maybe <coughs> eight or ten months ago, we have covered Tongani language. We have not only covered all the major languages of the country, we have covered several minor languages. The main strength of the web journal that I see is its enormous reach, its global reach. We cut across all frontiers. It overcomes the immediate problem of distribution. We don't have the money for physical distribution. Some promotion is required. Most of our promotion has happened with the word of mouth. But some promotion and some marketing is required. But there's hardly any effort towards physical distribution. The entire distribution happens on the internet. So that is not an issue at all. So these are some of the advantages that we looked at when we started. And has grown well. Today we have 20,000 hits every month on the news India site, which I would imagine is much more than many of the Indian print magazines can make. I don't think Indian magazines, literary magazines, I'm talking of literary magazines, I'm not talking of India Today's or Film Press, I'm talking of literary magazines. I don't think any Indian literary magazine has that kind of a so that was my experience of starting a literature, this was my dream, on the web has been a fine guy. Today there are several of them, even though we started 10 years ago and we were one of the pioneers. Today there are so many other literary magazines on the net. The other one that I can think of is Kritya, which is a bilingual uh, magazine. We have the founder editor of Kritya also in this, uh, in this literary festival. This is, uh, and there are several others. I would not like to name all, but all of them have been growing well. Let us let's also hear the experience of uh, the other, other panelists here. Some of them are in print version, some of them are in web journals. So now we like to. Hello. Uh, with my experience is a little bit different, I must say, from Mr. Rao. I have started two Indian magazines. Uh, the first one was a commission by the Embassy of Spain in Delhi. Um, I brought a copy. It's not little, I'm afraid. Um, this was, um, it was a, a very interesting project because it was fully uh, state-funded. Um, uh, it had its shortcomings mostly in uh, distribution, uh, but it was my first magazine, and, uh, and I think that that's where I started interacting with photography and trying to uh, make photography, um, um, uh, trying to create a dialogue between photography and literature. But as I said, the distribution was a problem because we could not sell it. This was a, a Spanish government funded project and this became a big issue. We, all, we could only give it to by hand. No? So it's, it's a very strange project because you cannot judge it by the market. You know, it's, it's, it's like it's in a 
in another universe. Um, when the, pro the funding finishes, the ambassador came, the ambassador went, the project stopped. But I'm very glad I did this for three issues, for three years. <coughs> um, the, this, with this, I started um, like a passion for photography that developed in another publication, independent, it's called Quantum. Um, we've made four issues so far. And this was done by a group of three people. Um, it was relatively easy, I think. Uh, I think it's relatively easy to start a magazine. The problem is how to sustain it. So we have to uh, get funding, be very creative with the funding. First, uh, an Asian organization, then the British Council, then the Japan Foundation. It's, it was very, very challenging um, and still is. So I don't know if I agree with the title of Golden Age for Little Magazines because I think it's very, very difficult to, to survive. Uh, but I mean, I, in a way, is that the price we pay for being an independent publication, which is a luxury, I think, to be able to be fully independent, to, to define the contents, to be uh, free from advertisement, so I mean, I think it's, it's been a wonderful experience, but I, I have to disagree with uh, the adjective golden, because um, it's not our case. Um, I, I, I brought the objects because even if we have, for example, for Puntum, we have, an, um, we have a website, the magazine is online, our focus has always been the object. And it's like some kind of fetishism, but if I could not bring a printout version, I would never do it. You know, many people over the years, we've, we've been telling about our economic problems, etc. Many people say, oh, why don't you go only for an online version? But for me, that has no interest at all. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not uh, an object, and it's not, uh, it's not sexy in a way. I mean, an online publication. And there is so much uh, good photography online. I think looking at photography requires a different media. I think the paper is the best. I, I think it's very, very difficult to fully appreciate photography uh, in, a, in a computer screen, even if I had to do it because I didn't I've learned by going online. No? And that's how I've seen most of the photography, but then if you compare it with the experience of seeing a book going through the pages, it, the, the order is very important also, then if you are talking about a narrative. So in our case, had there not been a printed version, we would not have been interested at all. So we, we can continue this conversation. But Thank you, Lola. I think the point that Lola makes is very important because I still see a certain amount of ambivalence towards you know, being published in an online forum as opposed to the printed page. Now your printed page may have maybe 100 buyers if it's a poetry book or 200 or 500, it may not go beyond that. But people will still want to see their name in print. There's still a certain validation involved there which I, I I found this when I edited an online anthology of contemporary Indian poetry. <coughs> this was for an American design which has been around for 16 years. So it's not like it's a flash in the pan thing that you know people don't take seriously. It is a very solid, serious publication called BigBridge.org. It's an arts and cultural uh, magazine brought out online by a poet called Michael Rothenberg. And, uh, when he asked me to do this anthology, of course being paid for it without the question because they have no money. And you know, the three magazines don't have money, unfortunately. Whether they are online or whether they are in print. And uh, I agreed to do it. And people sent me their poems. But there was that question, okay, it's appeared online, but uh, when is the print version coming out? And I said, sorry to disappoint you, there's not going to be a print version. Then there'd be the silence. And uh, I'd say, but you know, the, the advantages of being online is that you have a much larger audience. 
and you do have the credibility of an inside that has been around for 16 years. So, you know, it's not something to take lightly. But there was that little bit of disappointment. And I did speak to Heman Dipte of Poetry Wala just before coming here and I asked him, um, would you bring out a print version of this anthology? And he said, you know, and he's, he's very passionate about poetry. He will, he will do whatever needs to be done to promote it. But he said that if we do an, a print version of something that's online, no one's going to buy it because it's out there, you know. Having said that, I think it is also, you know, the, the, the number of, you know, Mr. Rao talked about the 20,000 hits that they get. I had the privilege of being interviewed by News India, and I know how much that mattered to me as a poet who comes from essentially a print medium, you know, and uh, because it was something that I could share online with people who mattered to me across the world. And people whom I didn't know at all recognized me through that interview and knew about my work in ways that they would not have had otherwise you know, access to. So I think, I think we've now reached a stage where internet is gaining the credibility that it did not have 15 years ago. What was happening was that the moment people realized they could publish poetry online or anything literally online, they would just put it out there without any thought to quality. Whereas what's happening today is that there is quality involved, there is the same editorial rigor that a print magazine would involve. It's not that you can just put out something and uh, expect to be accepted. It's not going to happen. And it's, uh, that's the way things should be. You know, I, I come from an environment where little magazines and literary magazines were very important to me as a young poet. I was 16 in the 1970s, when mid 70s when I started to write. It was very important to be published in a magazine like the Indian Pen, for example, something like this, which was how many pages? 38, 40 pages. This is a 1992 version, so this is much later. But magazines like that gave you the information about what was happening in the literary world, which today you get through Facebook and you get immediately, but in those days it was important. And it was also, uh, you know, something that gave you the first platform as a writer, which, which then stays with you for many years after you know, it's first been published. So I think both of them still do have their uh, their advantages. We're talking about the golden age of literary magazines or little magazines. I would say that no, I don't think this is the golden age, not yet. But uh, I do think that the web has been a very good thing to have happened to the literary world. And I do think that it is something that uh, should be encouraged by writers who believe in quality. And uh, I'm really glad to see that such magazines do exist. In those days, a lot of our movements, a lot of our big names today, Arvind Krishna, Nirotra, Mr. Ezekiel, these were the people who started their lives with little magazines. And we wouldn't know of them today if they hadn't done that way back when, you know, they, they, they had the passion to bring it out. And that passion is something that I'm happy to see being carried over into the, into the online world through websites that promote literature and literary output. But I would be concerned about quality and I would hope that, that quality is maintained as we go forward. And uh, because websites are so much easier to do than print. So I'm really happy that we are at this stage. I do think there is space for both and I do think we should allow print magazines to survive in spite of all the distribution problems, in spite of every other you know, issue that plagues such publications. But I think there's, there's a way to find a balance. Um, I um, do a bit of fiction editing, so I have a very small role in actively creating or um, making 
um, a literary magazine. I fiction edit through a, a publication, it's an online journal in Australia called mascara.com. It's, it's a journal that was founded, it was a brainchild of another poet, Australian Goan poet called Michelle Kyle. I think she's come to this festival previously. And um, it's a multicultural magazine and she had been very passionate about including more voices in the um, quite uh, well represented range of literary journals there are in Australia, but they're primarily print. And um, her focus had been bringing greater attention to uh, Asian, South, Southeast Asian, subcontinental and indigenous writing, but it's now become a forum um, and it's something of which she should really take the credit um, uh, for very high quality writing and it's a sought after journal. One of the things I was concerned about when she approached me um, was that it was online and I'm someone who is a print person and um, I've come around to the notion that we have I mean, it's now inevitable that one embraces uh, online as the format that uh, has reach and um, scope. And it makes it very, from a technical point of view, I think it makes it, I don't know what the processes are because I've actually not worked on a journal on an ongoing capacity <coughs> that's a print-based one, but technically, my, the work I do, editing, becomes much easier because of the format um, that we use for mascara, the online format. Um, I'm just trying to think of what angle I can <laughs> take to kind of um, bring some things into focus. In Australia we have a number of fantastic journals, so I'll just name a few of them. Um, Southerly's one from the U University of Sydney that's very, very good. Um, the Angens, another very well regarded one, University of Melbourne. There are some recent uh, uh, excellent non-fiction uh, journals that have um, come into the, into the landscape. So um, Griffith Review is a one that's um, also very good for, it make, there are people writing terrific essays about the environment, the political landscape in Australia. So we're not, um, and there are many, many more journals than I've mentioned. We're not, um, there's no, at, at this time in Australia, there are people buying, you know, print journals, but um, they struggle also with funding and this kind of constant struggle with, you know, uh, I think recently our, our funding body that's the Australia Council, our National Arts Funding Body, um, has enabled uh, journals to apply for five year long uh, grants so that they can be supported because it's primarily through government funding that these uh, journals can exist. They don't really have um, any other um, way of supporting themselves. Um, so five year funding is much better than say triennial funding because it allows them to know that they've got um, such a long period in which they can develop an agenda for whatever the, the uh, fiction or other, um, other work that they want to present in the, in the future will be. Um, I don't know whether I should add anything. I, I agree with uh, Lola and uh, Menta. <coughs> Certainly, you know, most of us want to see our own works in a print form. Uh, even the books and the articles that we write, if they are available in a book form, you know, it, 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 makes lot, it gives a lot more you know, satisfaction to see something in print or something like this. I'm not disputing that. The point that I was trying to make was that if you look at the entire media, media as a whole, all aspects, they are very strongly influenced by technology today. For the last 10 years, we have had computers, we have had other electronic devices. And today, today you are having uh, things like smartphones, 
high courts, high, high tax, tax credit, where everything is available to you, right from your emails and magazines and uh, the book in your hands. So this is the kind of influence that technology has had on the entire publishing industry. Still, very large number of major publications happen in print form, and they do go through them. I'm not, I'm not disputing that. The point that I was making was that starting a, starting a web journal is a lot more easier than starting a print version, print journal. I would like to re-emphasize again that the cost of starting a print journal is much more than a journal. That means the investments that you look for in starting a print journal is much more. For people with smaller resources who want to have some outlet for their creative energy, who want to start his own uh, magazine, uh, it's a lot more easier to do it on the web. And web has so many, so many facilities, that sophisticated software that you can produce really wonderful uh, magazines even on the web. In fact, most of the print, print, printed magazines and newspapers today have a web version. You can go to the internet, you can go to the internet and look at the web versions of all the newspapers of the country, all the magazines of the country. And a lot of work in producing the print print journals and print uh, newspapers is actually done on the computer and in a digital form before they are promoted into a print version. So I'm not disputing that print magazines have their own value and work and we would like to see our work in print. But all I was saying was, given the ease with which one could start a small magazine on it as a web journal, today you have a very large number of web journals fortunately started in India, which are doing reasonably well. Going back to my own experience of News India, if we were to start News India as a print journal, I don't think it would have started. Even if we had mobilized some funds to start it, maybe sustaining it, maybe taking care of its marketing, taking care of its distribution, would have required a lot more attention to us. Now when you are starting a journal, and when you are depending on the physical distribution of your printed version, how far can you distribute? How far geographically? Would you restrict it to your state? Would you try to distribute it across your entire country? Would you like to cross the borders and go to the other countries and become a global magazine? What would be the cost involved in that distribution? That is phenomenally large. Where the web technology has an enormous impact is on this, on this aspect. There is no distribution cost. That's why particularly when we are talking about little magazines, the chance of success of little magazine is much more as a web journal than as a print. As I said, I will repeat once again that I am not disagreeing with whatever Lola has said or Menika has said. They have the both. I am only talking about the relative advantages of the journal. If I may add to that, the Guardian recently, the Guardian recently wrote an article about literary magazines and little magazines and uh, talking about India, so, you know, it started off with that. And in, in fact, it interviewed Mr. Surya Rao uh, and Rati Saksena, who he mentioned. And it starts off by saying that there aren't many literary journals in India, and these days, especially in English. And the only ones that come to mind are the little magazine, which is a very big magazine, like, you know, Prodagantra in Delhi. And uh, it refers to the Sahitya Academy journal and says, beyond that, there are no literary magazines. And then it says, but is the literary journal dying a slow but inevitable death? And hardly continues. Scoff the growing number of journals that have been, you know, leading almost secret lives on the internet. They have merely shifted location. That's what that article says, and that's absolutely true. But, uh, you know, a phenomenon that didn't, that didn't exist 10 years ago, which I've seen today, is the sheer number of literary festivals like this one, which would offer a huge 
opportunity to distribute print magazines. I don't think that's really been taken advantage of so far. There is someone who can bring out a print magazine. And there are people who do that. There, are, there is a group of uh, young people in Bombay who brought out, uh, they brought out a journal called Nether. Just a couple of years ago, they started this. And uh, in fact, one of the people on the board said that uh, they get hundreds of applications, hundreds of submissions. So people do want to see that. And if such magazines find a space at, literary, at festivals like this, which are occurring across the country now, I think there is some hope of being able to revive them with some funding. It doesn't cost too much to bring out a print magazine of maybe 80 pages or even 40 pages. But it would, it would play a very important role in supporting this, you know, and bringing that balance to the online world. I think that's, that's important. There are enough corporates who should be tapped for that sponsorship. They can fund all kinds of rubbish, why can't they fund literary magazines? No, I think it's a great idea the, to combine a, a magazine, which is after all an abstract thing, an abstract idea that you've printed on paper, with a real activity like a festival. I think it's, it's great, and that's what we actually we are trying to do, because we are trying to for Pumtum into a festival's catalog. So we are evolving to a book catalog. Let's see how we can uh, be, let's see if we can be successful. But another thing, since we are talking about printed magazines and the distribution, the difficulties, is that it's, it's really, really complex for us uh, to be able to sell this outside has been extremely painful, I mean, paying a lot of money to European distributors. Then the market for magazines is very uh, unfair for those magazines which, are, which have a certain quality, printing quality, because what happens is you sell a certain number of copies to your distributor, whatever is not sold is destroyed. Sometimes with books, it's not the same. They, they are sent back or whatever. But whatever they don't sell, they just tear off the first page. And that's an incredible waste. Because for a publication like us, with a small print run, the, the price per unit was very high. So I think uh, my personal view is that it's better to evolve towards a book format, with a longer shelf life and something that is considered worth of keeping, and where people are willing to spend more money than in a magazine. I would also like to react to what Menuka had mentioned about the uh, overall quality of the content. Uh, <coughs> News India, for instance, the current issue for any issue for that matter, be running into something like 250 pages of a conventional uh, with as big as that. We have so much of content. And we have a number of editors who have to go through and edit this and go through everything before it goes to the final version that is released on the internet. So the rigor with which we edit the content and, and release it is as as good or as vigorous uh, as an information. Maybe some other smaller web journals may not have such rigorous standards of editing. But the same levels of rigorous editing can be introduced in web journals. Maybe there was some reaction from the question. I just like to say something when I did that online anthology also, I was surprised to find that the production process took a whole month after we had put together the anthology, I said, you know, because that's what you would associate with the print version, but the whole back and forth that happened before it was ready to be released to the public was just as painful and meticulous as doing it on paper. So what you're just saying absolutely right. Uh, let's take some questions. I have a quick question. Uh, it's the general belief that print magazines 
pay the contributors and the online magazines uh, do not pay or purchases the budgets are low Pardon? to the contributors is do you think that's a generally true <coughs> And I don't know if this is correct, 
but we were working on a tight budget and that was what uh, we could do. But the focus for me, whether it's commission or not. Uh, Mr. Rao, I, I would just like to, to know how you attract uh, traffic to your site and how are you able to market it clearly online? Which, as I said, we don't uh, actively promote our market. I'm talking of music. We don't actively promote our market. Uh, we do have, I mean, initially when we started, we did have many ways of number of writers of the country, number of writer bodies. And we, we approached them through the email and things like that. And thereafter it has just spread by the word of mouth. Today, today, today we have more than 6,000 members, as I said, from all the countries. This is not reach out to them consciously. It just happens that you know, people learn through their, their own colleagues and friends, and they become friends. So we have, we have been that really a lot. Obviously there are also, uh, with, with web, web journals, there is that opportunity to link your journal and to um, create a space on that web page for your association with other literary journals and um, that's something that's very good for collaboration and bringing attention um, to I guess the array of uh, good writing that there is I suppose if there's good writing it attracts people to to the to the journal that's that's a, um, yeah how it works in Australia thank you so Google Google search. Yeah. Uh, anyone wants to know? Anyone wants to know about you know Indian literature magazines or you know, any specific uh, magazine? They just go and do the Google search. Mm -hmm. From there, they I mean they contact or go to the site and register them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Thank you, Lola, Sunita, and Venka for a very nice session on the little magazine. Uh, it, it stands at a juncture where it will now surely move forward with uh, the internet age. And yet, the sanctity and the beauty of the object will also re remain. Let's hope they can both coexist side by side. Thank you very much. A big hand for them, ladies and gentlemen.